I like older, cheaper PC hardware that remains relevant over time, and I like powerful mini PCs, but those two topics don't often cross over. The high end of the mini PC market is where all the exciting new development happens. More sensibly priced options either run on super low wattage chips, or they run on previous gen tech, and that can mean they feel a little dated in comparison. However, if the price is right, I'm always willing to give older tech a chance to shine. The AM06 Pro was sent to me for review by Ace Magic, who are not paying me and have no say in the content of this review. Of course, although Ace Magic provided the unit, the box says it was made by Nipoji, which is the same brand that Camry sent me a couple of weeks ago. I asked Ace Magic about this and I was told that, quote, we co-brand with each other. As a guess, that means Nipoji is the original manufacturer, and Camry and Ace Magic are distributors, though I wouldn't blame you if the ambiguous nature of this branding put you off immediately. For purposes of this review, I'm willing to give this one the benefit of the doubt for now. This particular model of AM06 Pro is equipped with an AMD Ryzen 5 5500U, with 6 cores and 12 threads, as opposed to the 8 cores of the last model I tested. Again, the CPU is based on the Zen 2 architecture rather than the Zen 3 the name would imply. The TDP of the 5500U is actually the same as the 5700U at 15 watts. The on-paper limit of the 5500U is a max clock speed of 4GHz, but the low TDP and limited room for cooling will probably see it throttled back, especially in gaming where that 15 watts of power has to be shared between both the CPU and the integrated graphics. Like the rest of the 5000 series APUs, the 5500U has integrated graphics based on the technically obsolete Vega architecture, with 7 compute units at a top speed of 1.8GHz. The rest of the AM06 Pro specs are pretty similar to its big brother, with 16 gigs of DDR4-3200 provided as two SODIMs for easy upgrade or replacement, and a socketed 512 gig M.2 NVMe drive. It also inherits the AM02 Pro's lack of other internal drive options, so adding more storage will require using one of the external USB ports. Moving on to those ports, the unit's pretty well equipped, though there are some trade-offs compared to the last unit I tested. There are now only two USB 3 Type-A ports, both on the front of the unit alongside a 3.5mm combo jack and a USB Type-C, which is also USB 3 and is data only. On the rear, we still have dual display outputs in the form of an HDMI 2 and display port. There are two USB 2 ports, most likely for your mouse and keyboard, and a single USB-C which in this instance is actually used for power. Finally, we have perhaps the most niche feature, dual gigabit ethernet ports. If that's not enough networking for you, it also has dual band Wi-Fi 5 and Bluetooth 4.2, again via a user upgradable socketed unit hidden under the M.2 slot. Before I get onto the benchmarks, I wanted to make a quick mention of build quality as it's something that was brought up by a commenter in the AM02 Pro video. It seems like Nipoji, or whoever, doesn't exactly have the best reputation in this area. As the AM02 Pro was my first experience with the company, I had no complaints. Everything looked and felt fine, the materials felt solid and good quality, even the interior was very neat and had a professional looking shield protecting the PCB from probing fingers. The AM06 Pro is a little less polished. Internally, everything looks fine, no issues with fit or finish, and everything screws together very well, but the protective shield isn't present, and the choice of materials overall definitely communicates that this is more of a budget product. Thankfully, this is reflected in the asking price. The base retail price on Amazon UK is a rather excessive £379, but there's a plethora of discounts and codes available that brings it down to just over £240. This might still be a little too close to the AM02 Pro, but the only way to tell for sure is with... CPU-Z shows reasonably consistent results across benchmark runs, which is pretty rare for a mini PC due to heat and power constraints. The first run came in with a multi-core score of 3544, and while there was a small amount of throttling across the next four runs, it didn't go lower than 3400. The average multi-core score was 3498.3, a little less than 15% below the 5700U and the single core score of 494.4 is only 5% below the Ryzen 7. 
Cinebench R23 is also very consistent as any throttling is out of the way within the first minute or so. The multi-core score is 6471 and the single core score hits 1180. These are 13% and 5% lower than the 5700U respectively, which pretty much mirrors the results from CPU-Z. As the Ryzen 5 has 25% fewer threads than the Ryzen 7, that means there's a trade-off. The lower boost frequency is hitting the single core performance somewhat, but it's not having to throttle quite so hard in the multi-threaded tests. I ran the Geekbench 6 benchmarks, which I forgot to record a script for in the AMO2 Pro video, but I did take the numbers down for both the Ryzen 7 and the Ryzen 5, and the result is very interesting. The CPU scores are extremely close, with less than 2% in it on the single core test and less than 1% in the multi core. I can't really explain why, but Geekbench seems to think these are basically the same CPU. Anyway, there's a bigger gap in graphics performance with the OpenCL test giving the win to the Ryzen 7 by about 6.5% and the Vulkan test by over 7... No, wait, the, the Ryzen 5 wins the Vulkan test by 7%. What the hell? Leaving Bizarro World for a moment, the 3D Mark results go more as expected with time spicing an overall score of 1291 from the Ryzen 5 with the CPU scoring 5071 and the GPU just 1141. In the individual tests, the Ryzen 7 beats the 5 by 25% and 8.5% respectively, with the overall score being 9% in favour of the 8-core chip. Firestrike scores 3284 overall, with the CPU hitting over 15.5k and the GPU at just 3635. DaVinci Resolve's free edition has the choice of rendering in H.264, which uses the CPU unless you pay for the full studio version, or in H.265, which uses the GPU. In the CPU test, the Ryzen 5 completes my 5-minute 4K60 test render in about 36 and a half minutes, which is about 9 minutes behind the Ryzen 7, but more than 10 minutes faster than the 11th and 12th gen Intel i7s. The GPU also proves to be having more going for it in H.265 rendering than pretty much any of the Intels, so if you're opting for the H.265 codec, you could complete the same render in a mere 9 minutes 43 seconds, only about a minute behind the 780M graphics in the much more expensive 7840HS. This only really extends to rendering, however. The Intel CPUs and the newer Ryzen's still offer a better experience on the timeline with smoother playback and scrubbing. Blender, unfortunately, doesn't include a GPU rendering option on anything without a GeForce Discrete GPU installed, which rules out most mini PCs. We're therefore stuck with a CPU, and that means the classroom test scene renders in 14 minutes 16 seconds, a couple of minutes slower than the Ryzen 7, but again, way faster than the previous gen Intels. While you shouldn't expect modern games to perform well on a Vega iGPU, especially now that driver support's been put on the back burner, there's still some utility here if you don't raise your expectations too high. In Apex Legends, at 900p low, this PC can almost hit 60fps. However, it's a good deal uglier than when I tested on the Ryzen 7 system, as most of the textures are having difficulty streaming. Not to say this is unplayable, after all, you can play Apex on a smartphone nowadays, but it's less than ideal. Battlebit Remastered can play on a veritable potato of a PC, thanks to the minimum quality setting called... Uh, potato. Unfortunately, even at these very basic settings, you might want to drop resolution below 1080p, as while the AM06 Pro can produce in excess of 70 FPS on average, which should be more than acceptable, the minimum FPS is in the 30s. A 60 FPS cap might be an alternative solution as well, as that should at least take some of the workload away from the CPU and therefore improve frame pacing. Counter-Strike 2 borders on playability. My first game sh the bed with tons of long pauses in gameplay, which mirrors my experience with several other mini PCs, but after a while things settled down and my second match recorded a 60 FPS average. 1% and especially 0.1% lows were unacceptable however, and once again I suspect the power limits the culprit.
The story is similar or worse in Fortnite. The average at 1080 performance mode scrapes under 60 FPS, but lows are in the teens and point ones are in the single digits. Because the frame rate does occasionally rise above 60, adding a frame rate cap at 60 FPS should help, and it does, but not enough to be meaningful. Maybe a 30 or 45 cap would be better. GTA V, at least as a single player game, is less frustrating when the frame time is less than smooth, so you'll probably forgive that it doesn't quite manage a solid 60 FPS average. I haven't played GTA Online for more than a couple of minutes of my life, and I don't plan on giving it any more. Nevertheless, I hear it's more CPU demanding, so I'd expect to get far more stutters and hitching than I did in single player. Civ 6's AI turn time benchmark returned an average of 9.28 seconds per turn, about half a second slower than the 5700U I tested last time. This isn't a great title for mini PCs in general, I'm afraid, so you should probably save your world domination plans for something with a desktop class CPU. Gaming then seems to be off the table with this mini PC, however, if you're more into emulation, the 5600U is actually extremely capable. 80s and 90s consoles shouldn't pose a problem, PS1 plays pretty great in Duck Station with your choice of API and upscale to 1080p to boots. The same goes for N64 with GoldenEye 007 running like a dream in the 1964 GEPD emulator. Moving into the 2000s, things are less perfect. Rogue Leader is a tougher GameCube game to run on lower power CPUs, but if you can get past the occasional infuriating slowdown, it's not the worst experience I've ever had, and it can even upscale to 1080p. Gran Turismo 4 on the PS2 runs as close to a perfect 60fps at 1080p. Tatsunoko vs Capcom has the same issues as Rogue Leader, especially when a ton of special effects are flying around. Finally, Mario Kart 8 on the Wii U runs at an almost perfect 60fps, even upscaled to 1080. When reviewing this, I'm acutely aware that I'm writing two reviews, one for the APU, in this case the Ryzen 5 5500U, and one for the mini PC itself. I have no major complaints about either half. The 5500U is old tech, sure, but it does impressively well in emulation, and particularly in productivity tasks. It holds its own against some Intel chips which would have been positioned as much higher end than this. It has its flaws, of course. The 15 watt TDP is clearly holding it back, particularly in games, and the newer Zen 3 and Zen 4 chips would handle that better. The video encoder seems to be very competent for this type of chip, but the decoder certainly lags behind the aforementioned Intels, which is kind of expected. If you want to run heavily compressed 4K files in real time, Intel QuickSync or AMD's newer RDNA iGPUs are the way to go. Of course, most of those things cost significantly more than £260. So what corners were cut to get it to this price? Well, aside from it being an older chip, and the fact that AMD chips historically cost less than Intel's, the build quality isn't fooling anyone that this is a premium product, and both wired and wireless connectivity takes a dip compared to the more expensive models. Again, considering it's a budget product, I'm willing to forgive that. However, at this price, it has some strong competition from… well, from Nipoji. The AM02 Pro I reviewed a few weeks back is available with a slightly better 8-core CPU, has nicer overall construction, and costs about the same. Price is, of course, something that shifts a fair amount over time, and availability can't always be counted on, but at the moment I'm recording this video, the AM06 Pro doesn't look like the best deal. Unless the AM02 vanishes or rockets in price, it's probably the better choice. Anyway, there are links and discount codes below if you want to check it out for yourself, and the AM02 Pro video is linked on screen now. Thanks for watching, kindly do the usual YouTube things if you feel so inclined, and I'll see you next time.